You're listening to the Hillside Pulpit, a ministry of Hillside Baptist Church. This is Pastor Chad Henley, and I want to thank you for allowing the Hillside Pulpit to be part of your spiritual journey. If this podcast has blessed you in any way, would you consider leaving a five-star review on your podcasting app? That will help us get the word out to others. And we invite you to join us to worship the King at the Hill. Well, as I said, it's a privilege to be here with you today. Uh, last week, we uh, worshipped uh, in the dark without AC, and it was quite an awesome time, to be honest with you. I thought about cutting the breaker today, and, but I decided against it, so you're welcome for that. But um, it really was a sweet, sweet time, um, kind of low-key, and... Um, you know, the, the, you know, the church worshiped for about 2,000 years without air conditioning, so I figured we could go one Sunday. Um, but today we are starting a new, a new series um, uh, called Christianity in Controversy, Christianity in Controversy. I'm going to talk more about that just a little bit, but let me pray and we'll continue here. Father, Lord, again, we're just so grateful to be here, and Lord, now... God, I just, I ask for your help. Lord, I ask for wisdom and grace in my words as I, uh, as we talk about things that um, sometimes are hard to talk about, Lord, and sometimes are uh, divisive even, Lord. I just pray that uh, you would help me speak only that which is good and helpful and true. God, I pray that you would help us to uh, believe the best about each other as we talk through these uh, challenging things, and I pray that you would help us as a church, Lord, to, to uh, be that bright and burning uh, lamp, the shining city on a hill, Lord, that, um, uh, that uh, um, stands for your word and stands for your truth in service and hope and love to the world. And so just help us, God, as we navigate this uh, series and as we navigate this time, God, in a very divided and complex world. God, I pray you grant us wisdom as individuals and as a church to honor and glorify you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, let me invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. So as I said, um, this series is called Christianity in Conflict, Thinking Biblically Through Today's Most Pressing Issues. Okay? So I want to let you in on some of my thought process, processes first about why I wanted to do this. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I was a little reticent to do this uh, just because some of these things we'll be talking about are rather controversial. And if you know me, I don't really like stirring up controversy for the sake of controversy. In fact, um, if I have a problem, it's most of the time being a people pleaser and conflict avoider. And that's a real struggle that I have. And so why did I decide to do this? Well, it just occurred to me that these questions aren't going away and that I do have a responsibility as a pastor to address these issues, to shepherd his people and to help us think biblically about the things that the world is so confused about because these questions, they do matter. So what we believe about a lot of these questions, it's not just like, well, we can agree. To, I mean, we can agree to disagree, I suppose, but the impact of these decisions, though, are real. All right, what we believe about certain things is going to have real impact on real people, real people's lives. And so we want to think carefully and biblically about these things and to, and to shirk that responsibility merely out of fear didn't seem legitimate because at, at the end of the day, right, me, you, and everybody will ultimately stand not before the judgment seat of men, but before the judgment seat of God. The second thing that I want to say as we begin this series and this is for us in this room and also for anybody who might eventually listen to this uh, online or anything like that. Um, I just want to say that at no point is my aim to beat up or shame anybody if I talk about some things uh, that might be hard to talk about. Um, I view this series and my aim in this series is uh, you're my primary audience, so I'm speaking as a Christian pastor primarily to Christians, okay, who want to honor God, who want to obey Him, and who want to know what He has to say on these issues. So that's going to be my primary way of addressing and speaking about these topics. Um, obviously, if I was 
If I was speaking primarily to a different audience, uh, maybe one skeptical about uh, many of these things, I might speak differently, but I'm speaking primarily as a Christian pastor to Christian people. Uh, I will, from time to time, agree to uh, or attempt to persuade others, um, but my main goal is to just, if you are skeptical or disagree with me on some of these things, my main goal is just to simply to say, I hope you will consider my arguments and think about what I say on these things and, um, and weigh biblically uh, the arguments that I make. Finally, I want to say that some of these issues that we will talk about are more clear in Scripture than others. And so, as we do this, uh, I want you to know, and I hope you do know, that um, although, you know, I have many shortcomings and failings, one thing that I try to take very seriously is the authority of Scripture and the authority of Word of God. I always try to be very even-handed in the way that I handle Scripture. I never want to put my opinion into the Word of God, but I want to align my opinions with what God has already said. And so that's the posture that I'm going to be taking as I approach these questions. And so the clearer something is in Scripture, the more tight-fisted we hold it, and the less clear something is in Scripture, the more open-handed we can hold it. And I'll try to be fair to that as we approach these issues. Okay? So the first issue that we're going to deal with today, as you've probably already guessed, is a fundamental point of, I think, one of the greatest points of confusion in the Western world today, and that is the question of sex and gender and what it means to be, me to be male and female. Uh, this is one of the most urgent questions today, and it's extremely urgent because real decisions are being made off of what people believe about this reality. Uh, children are being given procedures or uh, hormones and things like that that irreversibly da damage people's bodies about these questions. Um, some said so there have been some, there's been some political action to at least threaten removal of children from homes if parents do not agree with what uh, the, the, the child wants to do and, and things like this. These are, not just, these are not just peripheral questions. These are questions that we need to know the answer to and have an answer for. Um, there, are some even put, there are some pushing today for biological males to compete in women's sports. Well, you know, how should we think about that? What should we think about that? If you have a daughter, do you want her competing against men in the sports that she competes in? I mean, these are questions that we have to think about and we have to think biblically through. So that's what we want to talk about as we talk about he made them male and female from Genesis chapter 1. Beginning in verse 26, if you're able and willing, let me invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in 26, we're, going to, we're just going to read a few verses here. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then jump down to verse 31 there. It says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. All right, so I'm going to be uh, very simple here on the verge of simplistic but I think it's important to just be simple and be clear. The first, we're going to talk about this under three points here today. Number one, God made us. God made us. Number two, God made us male and female. God made us male and female. And then number three, God made us good. God made us good. So number one here, the first point that is foundational to the others is that God made us. And so this point here actually has nothing to do yet about being made male and female. It's just the simple fact that undergirds the entire conversation that at least we as Christians should, uh, should have in terms of helping us understand the way to think about this. And that is the, brute, the, the simple fact that we were made by God. We were made 
by God, right? So the very first verse, literally the first verse in the Bible is, in the beginning, God made. In the beginning, God made. God made the heavens and the earth. I think the fact that those are the very first words in the entire Bible are profoundly important. Why these words first? Because that single sentence tells us almost an infinite amount, it tells us literally the most important thing we need to know about the, the world and ourselves, right? And that is that, it, first of all, it tells us that there is a God, right? In the beginning, God made the heavens and earth. So it tells us that there is, is a God. This, to some, that point is controversial, but really to most people, it's not. There are very, relatively few atheists in the world. Most people believe in some kind of higher power. All right, so this, this, this verse is just simply telling us that there is a God. So what that means then is that any conception of the world that doesn't have God in it is the wrong one, right? And that if I don't, if I don't conceive of reality and if I don't conceive of my own life without respect to God, then I have a wrong conception of my life. And of reality, right? Because if there is a God and, I, and I'm living like there isn't one, well, then I'm literally ignoring the most important reality, the, the important thing about the reality I live in, right? So that's the first and most important thing is that there is a God. And then the second thing this verse tells us is that not only is there a God, but there's a creator God. That means that he made everything, right? And so these, these two things are, the most, are literally the most basic Christian premises, Right? That there is a God and that he made everything. Okay? And so, if we, but if we accept, however, those two most basic Christian premises, that there is a God, that he made everything, if we accept that, then that literally changes, that it literally has to change everything about the way we conceive of the world and conceive of ourselves, right? Because if, because, right, if God made us, then by definition, we belong to him. And that he gets to say how we're to be and live in the world and not the other way around, right? You see, we have an idol today, if, if we're willing to admit it, and the idol today is autonomy, all right? And, and autonomy and subjective experience, all right? That is that we assume, whether we realize it or not, okay, and most people don't realize it, all right? But we assume that the primary thing we, ex the primary reason we exist is for ourselves and our own personal happiness. I'm telling you guys, that's the most basic fundamental assumption that most people in the world have today. I exist for myself and for my own personal happiness, right? That, and, and so, and so, in other, in other words, if we, if we believe, it, we might not say that out loud, but many people, even if we won't say it out loud, we, that's how they functionally live. In other words, my, my main job in life is to disco somehow discover who I am and live with whatever vision for my life that I think is going to happen to make me happy. This unspoken assumption that we exist for ourselves and our personal happiness as guided primarily by our feelings, okay? That's, that's kind of the basic... Uh, assumption of the world. But I'm just suggesting today, right, that if there is a creator God who made us, then our perspective on life has, then that perspective has to be incorrect, right? And this is the first point. Because if, if God made us, then we don't exist for ourselves to do whatever seems right to us. We exist for God and for the purposes for which he made us. Okay? So let me say that again. If God made us, then we don't exist for ourselves to do whatever seems right to us. We exist for God and for the purposes for which he made us, right? And so think about it. Every crea this is how, I mean, this is just how the nature of reality works, right? Every creative act works this way, right? <clears throat> if I create something, I create it for a purpose, right? The guy, I don't know who, I don't know who invented the hammer, right? Probably a long time ago. It's not that complicated. But whatever dude invented the hammer, right? He invented it. He didn't just say, I'm just going to invent a hammer for no purpose. He invented it for the purpose, right, of doing something, right? When we create something, we have a purpose for that creation, right? But, and here's the thing. The creator gets to determine the purpose for the creation, right? Not the other way around. 
And so if God created us, then clearly he created us for a purpose. And so our job then is to figure out what that purpose is, right? Because if you've ever tried to use something like a hammer for a purpose other than what it was designed to use, you know that lots of times bad things happen. A lot of people have been hurt using a wrong tool for the wrong job, all right? I about stuck a screwdriver through my hand one time learning that lesson, all right? Use the right tool for the job, all right? Tools are created, we're created for a purpose. Use it for the right purpose. When we don't use the right thing for the right purpose, things tend to break, all right? I tell my kids all the time when they do something, they, they use something for something it's not made to use for. I say, hey, don't do that because what? Because it's not made to do that. I tell my kids that all the time, right? Well, what happens when I try to use my life for things that it wasn't made to do? Things get broken, right? My heart gets broken. My life gets broken. My relationships get broken, right? That's how it works, right? We were made for a purpose. We were made to work the way God designed us to. And when we buck the purpose for which we were created, things get broken. Things get hurt. The reason why no one, no one would look at the world and say there's not brokenness. You can't. It's impossible. So we have to ask why, right? If, 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 if we basically are doing it right, why is there so much brokenness in the world? See what I'm saying? It makes no sense. Obviously, we're not doing something right, all right? And so the point is, is that if we want to know what's right, if we want to live in the best possible way that has the greatest possible chance of bringing us the greatest possible joy, we have to find, we have to find the reason why God made us and live the way he designed us to live, all right? God made us, and we belong to him. He knows how we were made to work. And when we buck that to go our own way, we do so to our own hurt, but when we embrace God's design for us and for our lives, that's when, we fall, that's, when we, that's when we find that life that we crave. So number one, God made us. That's, that's the simple fact that undergirds everything else. And that leads us to the important fact number two, and that is God made us male and female. God made us male and female. So if you go back, and again, in, the, in that passage, again, in verse 26, right, it says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over all the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps into the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so notice there that it says that God made us. And then it says that God made us in his image, okay, in his image. So this, again, al alone is incredibly profound, right? Because we are unbelievably privileged as human beings because we of all God's creatures were made in the image of God, right? In the ancient world, right, an image, images were made of of rulers and deities to both reflect and to represent them in the world, right? So we were made to both reflect God and represent God in the world, okay? And note, and, and note here how closely there is a close connection here between being made in God's image and being made male and female. They're literally side by side in verse 27. God created man in his, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, Male and female, he created them, right? So think about this. To be humanity as made in God's image is to be made male or female, right? Humanity as a whole bears the image of God, okay? And we bear the image of God together, together as male and female, all right? So... I think the best way to understand that is to, is to say that women reflect the image of God in certain ways that men don't. And men reflect the image of God in, in certain ways that women don't. And together, men and women bear the full image of God. And so as we think about this reality, there's a few points that I, I want to make, a few conclusions that I want to draw. Number one is very simple. To be human is to be either male or female. To be human is to be either male or female. So God distinctly created humanity 
in two sexes or two genders. And I know there's some difference in definition, but I'm, I'll explain why I'm using them this way in a little bit, okay? But there's only two genders or two sexes. God created humanity, male and female, right? So again, my point here is not to disparage or belittle anybody who's feeling genuine confusion over these matters. But what I want to say is that part of the confusion that we have today um, is this reticence, this reticence or this, uh, to acknowledge the differences between men and women or a desire to abolish all differences between men and women. And part of the thing that has added to the confusion is this rejection of the simple fact that God made us either male or female, right? So if I tell you that you're either A or B, and then someone else comes along and says, well, actually, you can be either A through Z, well, guess what? You're going to be really confused. How do I know that? Uh, have you ever tried taking one of your young children to Baskin Robbins? Okay. Their brains literally explode. Why? There's too many options. They can't decide. It brings too much confusion, okay? And I'm not saying that's the exact same thing as experiencing gender dysphoria, but what I am saying is that if there are only two options, but then we arbitrarily make it, uh, you know, three dozen, then that's going, to bring, that's going to introduce unnecessary confusion into the equation. And that, that's part of what's contributed to the great deal of confusion that we have today. All right? Uh, God made us male and female. And we know that. We know that that's true because God designed us as human beings. And part of our humanness includes the biological realities of our bodies. Okay? Which is why right after it says that God made humanity male and female, he told them to do something. He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Okay, so there's no, it goes without saying, hopefully, that being male and female is closely connected to the ability to, to be fruitful and multiply. That is, our maleness and femaleness is closely tied to the, the idea of biological reproduction, which was part of God's design for humanity. Okay, and so obviously I'm not saying that everyone will have kids, and Jesus never had children, and he lived the most fulfilled fulfilled Christian life. So I'm not saying everybody has to have children. But what I am saying is that every human being without exception is designed in such a way to at least have the biological capacity or potential capacity for biological reproduction. Okay. And so that is that we all exist in such a way that we manifest either male or female sex traits, physical uh, uh, traits, organs, h hormonal qualities, okay? And so despite the, the vehement efforts to confuse the issue, the truth is, is theologically and even biologically, it's, it's very clear. There are only two genders or sexes because God designed, this is how God designed us to exist as his image bearers. We reflect God either as male or female. And that brings us to the next point, and that is that sex and gender should always align. So again, I say this because if, if you're not super familiar uh, today, many, you know, the, the prevailing um, uh, kind of uh, definitions uh, is, that, uh, is that sex and gender are different, that, there are two, that sex refers to a person's biological state, the, uh, the f male or female biological reality, sex organs, hormones, chromosomes, etc. That's one person's Sex, And then they say that gender is something different. That gender is a subjective state uh, of a person or the cultural expression of one's sex that varies from society to society and generation to generation. So in other words, uh, sex is linked to biology, whereas gender is more of a, of one's mental, uh, a, a result of one's mental state or mental self-conception. Okay. Uh, but what I'm saying is that if we accept the fact that God made us, okay, and that he, that he created us male and female, then what I'm saying is that then that means that we are male and female regardless of how we feel about it. And I'm not saying that to be mean or rude, but I'm, 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 but I'm just saying that 
we have to recognize that we live in a day where I believe our mental state has been given too much priority over biological realities. Okay, so just, just let me explain what I'm talking about here, and I think it'll make sense. If 100 years ago, just, 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 let's just say 100 years ago, if I went to my doctor and I said, I believe that I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, okay, I told my doctor that. 100 years ago, my doctor probably would have said something like this, okay? Well, here's what we need to do. He would say, actually, Chad, your body says that you're a man. So what we need to do is let's work on your mind and let's help you get your mind to, 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 a, a for, to conform to what your body says to be true. Okay? Now you fast forward 100 years to today, and if I went to the doctor and I said, I think I'm a woman trapped in a, a man's body, there's a good chance that that doctor today will say, okay, Chad, well, your mind is telling you who you really are, so your body must be wrong. So now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to change your body to conform to your mind. So do you, so do you, do you see the difference that's taken place over the, over the time frame, right? It's, a, it's, it's, not, it's much deeper than people think. It's a worldview issue. It's a way that we conceive of reality. A hundred years ago, people would have said, people said that your, your biological reality trumps your mental state. Today, people are saying your mental state trumps your biological reality. Well, which one is it? Well, I'm saying that God designed our bodies, God designed biology, and so it's more, it's, and so, our, and so the, the former is correct, not the latter. That our, our biological design tells us who we really are, and so I, need, I then need to, by God's grace and God's help, and I'm not denying anybody's strong feelings of confusion or dysphoria, but I'm just saying that the correct way to approach this is to say, you know what, okay, I might be, my, my mind is, seems unsettled on this matter, but I know what's true because of my biological reality, so I need to work to adjust my mind to align with that, all right? And now, the reason why this is so important, and the reason why I think if we sit down and think about it, it's, this is by f- obviously the best course of action, is because think about, now come on guys, think about how fickle our mental states are. How many times have you changed your mind about something? How many times have you thought, I'm sure this is the right thing to do, and then realize later you still made a mistake anyway? Right? Our mental states are very fickle. Our mental states are, are often wrong, all right? So, if, so how risky is it then for me to make permanent life-changing decisions about my body or somebody else's body uh, uh, given a mental state, all right, that is known to be untrustworthy and can quickly change? You know, there's been studies that have shown that most young people that experience gender dysphoria, if, just, if, if nothing is done other than just kind of counseling them and helping them walk through that, most of the time those feelings change as they age. Think about it. How does our mental, how does our mental state change? Just think about it. God help me, you can ask Meg. I'm really bad about getting hangry. When I'm hungry, I just, I get ill. I don't know why that is. It's just a fact, right? So if hunger can change my mental state quite drastically, what else can do that? Stress, hormones, uh, trauma, okay, uh, uh, physical mental development, diet. All of those things can change my mental state, right? Now look at a child. What, what is a child going through around the, their, their, the years of puberty? Stress, hormonal changes, anxiety, right? Biological and mental development. Everything that we're talking about is literally going on at that stage of life, right? And so I think it's, I think it's drastic and foolish, right? To, to leap from there to, 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 do, to, do, to do permanent harm to an otherwise healthy body. And so these are things that we need to think about, right? These are questions that we need to be courageous enough to ask, all right? And, and so if God made, so the point is this, if God made me a man, the way I honor God is by embracing my masculinity. If God made you a woman, the way you honor God is by embracing your femininity. So I'm not, again, I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, masculine, feminine stereotypes, okay? But I'm talking about biblical manhood and womanhood. There are masculine and feminine stereotypes that are not biblical, all right? 
But I'm just saying, but there is distinctly, there, but there is such a thing as distinct masculinity and distinct femininity. And I just want to say it's a beautiful thing to be a man and it's a beautiful thing to be a woman. Because God made us that way. And that we will actually flourish when we choose to embrace the way God created us to be. So, to be human is to be either male or female. Sex and gender should always align. And then, finally, number three here. Our male and female, our maleness or femaleness is a fundamental part of our identity. Okay? Is a fundamental part of our identity. So, God made us male and female. All right? So, again, I think, I think this has made bigger inroads than we even realize, even within the church. The truth is, is when it says he made us, God made us in his image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. I don't think, I think we, you know, there's been a lot of effort put to minimize the differences between male and female. And I'm not saying the right thing to do is necessarily to maximize the differences. But I think, I think it's just, I think the right thing to do, though, is to say, you know what, God made us this way, and it's good, and there's nothing wrong with being different. Being male and female is a fundamental part of our identity, right? How? Because everything I do, I do as a man. Because I am one, right? It's, it's inescapable, right? I inhabit a male body with a male brain and male hormones, right? And the same thing is true if you're a woman, all right? Everything you do, you do as a woman. Our DNA our DNA either contains XX or XY chromosomes, okay? It's just, it's just a biological fact, okay? Those, that DNA contains the genetic information that tells our cells how to build the proteins uh, that ultimately form the, 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 the metastructures of our bodies, the organ system, the, the, the sexual system, all of these things, right? It's all embedded in our DNA, which every single cell in our body contains, okay? So if we just think about that, it's amazing. It's breathtaking, right? I'm inescapably male because God wanted me to be. You're inescapably female because God wanted you to be, according to his good will and to his good wisdom. I get to reflect God in distinctly masculine ways. Women get, get to reflect God in distinctly feminine ways, all right? These ways are different at times, but they're good, right? And that's the way God wanted it to be. Right? You know, there's something beautiful about, there's something more beautiful that, about two singers singing in harmony than singing the same note. And that's, that's how God wanted it to be with male and female. There's something more beautiful, more reflective about God's beauty, about two people playing, uh, being made differently and, and functioning in two different ways than if they were exactly the same. And to, and, but it's only together that the male and female in harmony display the beauty and the glory of God in ways that fit our distinct maleness and femaleness. So in other words, I'm, and so in other words, I'm saying it's good to be a man, it's good to be a woman. These are good things worthy to embrace the way God designed us to be. So number one, God made us. Number two, God made us male and female. And finally, number three, and it goes without, kind of goes without saying, but it needs to be said. God made us good. God made us good. In Genesis 1.31, it says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And so when I read this story and I get to that verse, it always kind of, I always get taken aback a little bit because it's just, it's beautiful. God made creation and he flung the stars in the orbit. He set the galaxies spinning. He he formed and shaped the earth to be habitable. And then he places, then he creates human beings in his image and places, him on, places us on his earth to rule and reign and reflect him in the world. And the vast beauty of the, from the vast beauty of the cosmos to the intricate details of DNA in a biological cell, right? God designed it all. And then he took a step back on day seven and said, behold, it's very good. It's very good. It's exactly the way he wanted it to be. 
And guess what? That male, he created the male and female, that, that was already there. That was already there by the time he got to that point. So in other words, he made us male and female, and it was a good thing, right? Now we know sin entered the world, right? And that messed up everything. Uh, and it broke everything, including the way that we perceive of our own sexuality at times. But one thing that I want to point out that sometimes we don't recognize is that we live in a day that manipulates through dissatisfaction. We live in a day that manipulates through dissatisfaction. You know, one of the easiest ways to control people is to convince them that they're unhappy or that somebody's taking advantage of them. And I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. But what I am saying is that we have to recognize that we live in a day where, our, uh, where contentedness is an incredibly rare trait to find to find someone that's actually just happy, right? And social media and all the media uh, preys upon that, right? Because if it can get you to be unhappy about something, it can get you to buy their product. It can get you to watch their show, right? It can get you to, you know, to, to, to whatever it may be, all right? And, and, and because we're broken and because we're sinful, our, our, our hearts and our minds don't always work the way that they should, all right? And so... What I'm saying is that if we can embrace the way God created us to be, all right, that there's an incredible peace there. There's an incredible rest, that can, a rest of heart that can be found to say, you know what? God made me this way, and that's okay. God made me male. God made me female, and that's who God wanted me to be, and that's okay. And guess what? If he made you that way... Guess, it doesn't matter, okay? So, like, if, if, you're, if you're a little tomboyish, okay, as a girl, whoop de doo okay? You're still a woman, all right? That is, there's nothing in the Bible that says you can't like to play sports or do some things that men like to do. It's not that big of a deal, all right? You're still a woman, all right? If, okay, if you're a man, all right, okay, and you're, you're not Rambo, all right, and you don't like to strangle animals with your bare hands, okay? It's okay. It's all right. You don't have to be that to be a man. That's not the essence of being a man. All right? There are different things about being men and being women biblically that we could look at, and that's, that's a whole other sermon. But what I'm saying is you don't, you don't necessarily have to fit certain stereotypes and think, oh, well, I must not be this. Look, God made you who he wanted you to be. All right? As revealed in our biology. Okay? And it's a good thing. All right? At root, we're either male or female. And so there's, there was a book that came out not that long ago, and I encourage you to, to read it. Um, uh, it was written by a lady named Nancy Piercy, but it's a book called Love Thy Body. All right? And it talks about a lot of these issues. But the point is, is that, you know, sometimes we can, we can un, un, unexpectedly, all right, we can get into this, uh, this state where we, you know, uh, we, we, we view our bodies as our own enemies. But God made us the way he wants us to be. And so as I, as I close, I just, I just want to say that if, if you are struggling or if anyone at any point watching at some point has struggled with uh, gender dysphoria, the first thing I want to say is that I'm not denying, I'm not denying your, your feelings. Uh, these feelings can be uh, very strong and can be quite painful to experience, and, and you're not sure what to do. And, and so I, I, I understand that. And so my hope and my prayer is simply this, that, that you'll consider, as you think about these things, uh, that this, this possibility, and in fact, I will say this reality, that God didn't make a mistake when he made you the way he made you. He didn't make a mistake. He made you the way he wanted you to be. And so, and so I hope that that reality uh, we'll, just, we'll just sink into your heart that if, if God made you a man, it's because you were wonderfully and beautifully made to glorify God in that way. If he made you a woman, the same is true. All right? And so just, and so again, you know, our feelings vary and our feelings change, but, but we can know what God wants us to be, and we can embrace that. And, and, and yes, and, 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 and sometimes that's, it's hard. Our mental state's sometimes hard to control, but I'm saying by God's grace, we can embrace that. And so you know what, God? I want to be who you made me to be and embrace, embrace the goodness that when God made us, he looked, when God formed you in the womb, he looked over all that he had made and said, behold, 
very good. Very good. And so that's what, that's what, that's what God's grace can do. And so, and so as I close, you know, I just, as always, I just, I just extend this invitation. All right? The world brings lots of confusion, and, and our hearts are fickle and, 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 and easily deceived. And so the, really, the only way that any of us can escape uh, the, the, the prison of our own mind at times is for us to receive a new heart and a new mind. And that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. When we turn from our sins, when we acknowledge what he's done for us, died on the cross, rose from the grave, is coming back one day, he gives us a new heart and new mind. Paul says that we can receive, we can receive the mind of Christ, all right? And that's what changes us, and that's, what's, that what's, that's what empowers us to change. You know, I've been there too. I've had feelings before in my heart and my life where, where I, I, I literally thought, I have, there's no way, I do not know how to, to change. Well, you guess what? I didn't, but God did. God knew how to change me, and he did. And so maybe you're feeling as helpless as, as, as I did before today. And I'm saying, you might not know the way, but Jesus is the way. And he can, he can help you if you turn to him. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you, Lord, that, that you made us male and that you made us female for your glory to reflect your image. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to embrace our masculinity, our femininity, to be who you have made us to be, Lord, and to express that in the way that you would have us, you would have us to do that. Um, Lord, uh, you know what's right. You know what's good. You know what's true. And so help us to be obedient to you. And God, I do pray. God, I pray for anyone who uh, just maybe, maybe in, in, in truly just a lot of, of internal turmoil over this issue. God, I just pray for supernatural peace, that you would grant them just rest of heart and mind, knowing that they're who, who exactly you made them to be. And so, God, as we, as, we, as we look to you today, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, help us to praise you for the goodness of who you made us to be and help us to embrace it, God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.